Honolulu, Hawaii, April 12th, 1941. Tadashi Morimura, the new vice consul at Japan's Consulate General in Honolulu, is unusually daring for a civil servant. A private pilot, he rents small aircraft to fly around the island and swims the southern waterways. He also visits the geisha bars favored by local Japanese and visiting naval officers and loves chatting up the girls for gossip. And he lives unusually far away from work, eight miles to be precise, in a second floor apartment overlooking Pearl Harbor. Now, if that all sounds odd to you, there's a good reason, because that identity is a cover. In reality, he's Ensign Takeo Yoshikawa of Imperial Japanese Naval Intelligence, a specialist in U.S. Navy warships. His job is to provide descriptions of the harbor and monitor which vessels are in port. And he reports this information back to Tokyo via diplomatic cables. Cables that, he has no way of knowing, are being read by the American military. The countdown has started. Thanks so much to NordVPN for helping to keep us safe on the internet. For a two-year plan on a huge discount, use code ExtraCreditsVPN at NordVPN.com slash ExtraCreditsVPN. April 13th, 1941. A train station in Moscow. Foreign Minister Matsuoka and the Japanese delegation are in high spirits. They're slapping backs, hugging, many of them a little intoxicated, after a celebration banquet. For half a century, Japan has feared an attack by Russia, but no more. Over the last several months, Matsuoka has been negotiating a non-aggression pact between Japan and the Soviet Union, and today they signed it. And as the conversation on the platform dwindles, Matsuoka turns to see an unbelievable sight. Walking through the crowd is Stalin himself. Come to see Matsuoka off. This never happens. Stalin doesn't go to the train station to give diplomats a personal farewell. And it's at that moment that Matsuoka feels the weight of history and how badly the Soviets wanted this arrangement. Now, Stalin can withdraw troops from its border with occupied Manchuria and send them west, and Japan, for its part, could remove their own troops and push south. But when Matsuoka arrives back in Tokyo, he found that plan had become a bit more complicated. For in Washington, Ambassador Nomura had hashed out a draft resolution that could normalize relations with the U.S. If Japan would agree to withdraw troops from China, merge its Chinese puppet state government with Shang's nationalist government, and pledge to recognize Chinese independence, the United States was prepared to recognize Manchuria as a Japanese possession, normalize trade, and end racially discriminatory immigration laws. And Prime Minister Konoye was considering it. After all, he wanted out of the Chinese quagmire. And, while it might come off as a betrayal of the Japanese soldiers who died in China, it could prevent thousands more from dying in a Pacific-wide conflict. Matsuoka was livid. He insisted that the draft be shown to their German allies and said that the time to attack British Singapore had come. After all, he'd spent over a year forging diplomatic agreements with Germany and the Soviets to keep the pressure off Japan. And what, now they were just gonna give in? Matsuoka started to go rogue. He made a counteroffer where Japan gave up nothing and started to denigrate Kanoe in public. Worse still, once Nazi Germany broke its non-aggression pact and invaded the Soviet Union in late June, he insisted that Japan should abandon the Southern Strike and instead invade the USSR in support. Kanoe, deeply embarrassed, had to personally apologize to the Emperor for Matsuoka's conduct and give assurances he did not plan to provoke a war with Stalin. In fact, the fiery diplomat's presence had even become a sticking point in negotiations, with Secretary of State Cordell Hull suggesting that talks could not go forward with Matsuoka still in government. He also demanded that Japan quit the tripartite pact. And when Matsuoka started to act without consulting the cabinet, Kanoye decided it was time for him to go. So his ministers dissolved the cabinet and reformed it without him. In Washington, Roosevelt and Hull were overjoyed. With Matsuoka out, perhaps this signaled a cooling off of military aggression. Their hope was misplaced. Four days later, under the threat of military action, Japan had reached an agreement to occupy the southern portion of French Indochina, moving into air bases that would allow them to bomb British Malaya, Singapore, and the Philippines. A hard response was needed, and Roosevelt delivered. He announced he would formally cut relations, put an embargo on goods, and freeze all Japanese assets in the United States, with that last measure cutting all American oil sales to Japan. Yet days later, he gave Nomura a new offer. Pull out of Indochina and make it a neutral territory, and the assets would be unfrozen. 
See, the U.S. oil embargo wasn't a full embargo. That would leave Roosevelt without much flexibility in negotiations. Japan obtained American oil by buying licenses to purchase a certain volume, and Japan had already obtained enough licenses to keep them supplied until 1943. But that oil had to be paid with U.S. currency, held in American banks, and those were the assets that were frozen. Though, technically, the Treasury Department could decide on a case-by-case -case basis to allow Japan's license purchases to go through. So Roosevelt could, essentially, loosen or tighten Japan's supply of oil in a carrot-and-stick approach. Nomura didn't even pass on the proposal to Tokyo, knowing that the militarists, especially Minister of War Hideki Tojo, had boxed Prime Minister Kanoye in. On August 1st, the economic measures went into effect. Yet Roosevelt's measured approach was not followed. As he took a two-week diplomatic visit to meet Churchill, the Treasury went hardline and denied all Japanese oil purchases. Then, given the popularity of this tough stance among friendly nations, Roosevelt retroactively endorsed it. What he didn't endorse, however, was coming to those nations' defense. All summer, British and Dutch diplomats had tried to get Roosevelt to commit, even informally, to fight together should Japan attack in Southeast Asia. American diplomats instead ducked, saying negotiations with Japan were ongoing and the time was not right. In truth, Roosevelt was unsure that the isolationist American public would support him going to war, even if Japan attacked. Would American parents, he wondered, accept their sons dying just to hold on to the Philippines or preserve British control of Singapore? At the time, probably not. But Roosevelt's attempt at deterring war again did the opposite. Now Japan was on the clock, with over 90% of its oil obtained from the U.S. If war was coming, every day they waited to strike south, they would have less fuel to operate with. Under wartime consumption patterns, they predicted they could only keep their ships moving and planes flying for a year. So their options now were to either pull out of China, which the army wouldn't accept, or strike south. And yet, American negotiators dawdled. They were in no hurry, each day seeming as if their hand in a potential war grew stronger. Over the next several months, Prime Minister Kanoye tried desperately to find a middle ground, including brokering a face-to-face -face meeting with Roosevelt in Alaska. Meanwhile, the planning for the strike south with an optional attack on Pearl Harbor advanced. The plan had gained formal approval as a contingency should negotiations fail, but militarists increasingly found that Emperor Hirohito did in fact favor a diplomatic solution. At a meeting on September 6, 1941, a militarist officer told Hirohito that a war with the United States would be over in three months. Not believing this, the emperor pushed back, saying that they'd said the same thing about China. China is big, explained the officer. Bigger than the Pacific, the emperor responded. And he finished the meeting by reading a poem his grandfather, Emperor Meiji, had written on the eve of the Russo-Japanese War. A poem about how the sea linked all nations and should be at peace. But he did give his assent to war if diplomacy failed. And as the weeks dragged on without progress and the Alaska summit looked doubtful, pressures began to mount. And at a conference on September 25th, Minister of War Tojo pushed for an internal deadline. If no diplomatic options were reached by mid-October, Japan must put in motion plans for a military solution. It was agreed. Fleets began to gather and make ready. October 12th, 1941, near Mount Fuji. Konoe has brought the biggest figures in government to his private estate for a last-ditch effort to prevent war. There, he leans on Tosho, saying that he's not confident a war with the United States can be won and that he's not equipped to lead the country through it. He threatens to resign. He also enlists allies from the Navy who privately oppose the war and think that defeat is likely, but who are also not brave enough to make their anti-war views known amongst their colleagues. The best he can get from them in the moment is to say that setting a deadline was a mistake and that they'd asked for imperial approval of the strike too early. Tojo will not budge. The sticking point is what it's always been. The army refuses to pull troops out of China. Not only does Tojo see doing this as betraying the dead, but much of the army's political power is wrapped up in the war. After many contentious hours, the meeting breaks up. And four days later, Konoe resigns from his post, and the emperor appoints his successor, Hideki Tojo, who tells Admiral Yamamoto to begin preparing his strike force for war. 
He, of course, didn't tell them that over the internet because it wasn't exactly a thing yet. But if it was, and he didn't want other folks listening, he definitely should have been using NordVPN. You know, again, in this alternate universe where the internet existed during this current time in history. You get what I'm going for. Now, if you follow some of your favorite creators on social media, you might hear a story from time to time about a channel getting hacked, basically a creator losing access after a successful attack or a leaked password or something. In fact, recently, this happened to a fellow Nebula creator, Alex's Corner, whose channel actually got stolen and turned into a repository for cryptocurrency scam videos. Yikes. And it's really no surprise when you think about it, right? We're all constantly being bombarded by emails that appear to be from YouTube or our banks or social media accounts, but are in fact just attempts to steal our passwords. This practice, as we all know, is called phishing. That's with a PH, not the kind that Zoe eats. Yet. And these phishing attempts are getting better every day, so it's not crazy to think that one or two might sneak through one day and trip any of us. Which is why I am super thankful for NordVPN's threat protection, which actually includes a specific feature to warn you about phishing links, as well as features like a blocker for malicious ads and dark web monitoring to alert you if your passwords have been leaked. Kind of hitting it from all angles there. Not to mention all of these features come with their robust and easy to use VPN, so not only is your data protected, right, but you can also use any one of their blazing fast servers around the globe to, oh, I don't know, maybe take a virtual vacation to a place's IP address that has a more impressive Netflix library than your current country. If one were so inclined, I am inclined. So to protect your data that matters and get the best price for online security, all you gotta do is use the code extra credits VPN at the link below. Then you'll get a huge discount on a two-year plan with a 30-day money-back guarantee, mind you, so there's really no risk, and you'll receive four extra months of next-generation protection absolutely free. And then once that's all taken care of, not only will you never be scared about your internet security again, but you can also take to heart that you're helping to financially protect this channel with your support as well. As always, thank you so much for that support, and happy browsing! Well, shucks howdy there, Ahmed Ziad Turk, Angelo Valenciana, Arcalite Games, Casey Mustia, Dominic Valenciana, Joseph Blame, and Skylar Holmes. Thanks so much for being legendary patrons.